Uh, this week, we are honored to have uh, Olya Mandelstam, and we'll talk about multi species tarps, tarps, I cannot pronounce that, and modify McDonald polynomial. Um, oh, hi. Yes. So, so thank you for inviting me to, to give a talk. Uh, and I apologize to those of you who were at CAAC um, this, this weekend because I'm giving the same talk that I gave there. But, uh, so I will be talking about a new connection between uh, a statistical mechanics model and uh, McDonald polynomials specifically. Uh, so the multi-species totally asymmetric zero range process, uh, TASERP for short, uh, which is uh, connected to modified McDonald polynomials. And this is joint work with Arvind Iyer and James Martin. So I'll start with uh, describing a, uh, a well-known connection between McDonald theory and statistical mechanics. Uh, which is through this, this particle process called the ASAP or asymmetric simple exclusion process. Uh, and then I will define uh, the uh, zero range process or TASERP, uh, which is the new model that I'll be talking about. And finally, I'll talk about the combinatorial real object that, uh, that, that describes the link between those two. So uh, let's start with a uh, very brief intro to McDonald polynomials. So let's take the ring of symmetric polynomials in n variables and polynomial is symmetric if it's invariant under uh, permutation of its variables. So we have several uh, very natural bases. Uh, for example, there's the monomial symmetric functions. Um, and Another important basis is the shear functions, and all these bases are indexed by partitions. And the shear functions can be uh, described in uh, the following way that, sh that shows why they're a very natural basis to use. So we consider the standard inner product uh, for symmetric functions, then uh, the shear functions are the unique uh, basis that is orthogonal with respect to this inner product and upper triangular with respect to the monomial symmetric functions. So this is, this is one way that we can define them. So as combinatorialists, uh, we also like to describe shear functions as generating functions over fillings of uh, of Tableau. So specifically, uh, they are semi-standard fillings of Young diagrams of the corresponding shape. And here's an example of S21. So now McDonald polynomials can be defined in an analogous way. So let's now consider the ring of symmetric polynomials with added parameters Q and T. And so uh, McDonald introduced this family of uh, homogeneous symmetric polynomials, uh, which we denote by P lambda, that form a basis in this ring. And they are uniquely determined by the following. So they're an orthogonal basis for the ring with respect to the, uh, the, the inner product generalized for Q and T. And they're also upper triangular with respect to M lambda. So uh, in particular, uh, we get back the sure functions when we set Q equal to T. This is because the McDonald inner product uh, just reduces to the usual inner product in that case. Uh, and so here's, here's what one of these polynomials looks like. So it's, uh, it's not, it's not actually a polynomial, even though we call it that it's, um, its coefficients are rational functions in Q and T. 
And there's also a non-symmetric version uh, denoted by E lambda. So, so uh, this was introduced by McDonald to study the symmetric McDonald polynomials uh, because it is much easier to construct them uh, than the P lambdas. Uh, so they so they can be described as as eigenfunctions of uh, certain prime operators of the of the um, of the doubly affine Heck algebra. So I won't I won't go into more detail about these polynomials. Just want to give some context of of what of what they are and how they fit into uh, combinatorics. So. There's also a tableau formula due to Hagelin, Him, and Lur for the P lambdas. Uh, and this is a, you can think of this as a QT generalization of the tableau formula for uh, share functions, say. So it's some way of assigning weights in Q and T to fillings of uh, Young diagrams of shape lambda. Okay, so now the modified McDonald polynomials, which are denoted by H tilde, are a transformed version of P lambda. So they were introduced by Garcia and Heyman. Uh, and as you can see, they are actual polynomials in Q and T. So in this example, you see that they have nice coefficients, unlike the P lambdas. And so they are obtained by applying a formal operation called plethism to a normalized form of P lambda. Uh, the normalized form just means um, more or less that the, that the denominators are cleared. Uh, and so their coefficients are not, not just integers, they're also positive integers, in fact. And there is a very nice formula for them, also due to Hagelin, Heyman, Lur, in terms of uh, fillings of diagram of lambda with, uh, with Q and T, uh, the, the MAG and INF statistics. So uh, it's, it's been known for a, quite a long time that uh, there, there is some very intriguing deep connections between McDonald polynomials and statistical mechanics. Uh, I, I won't go into uh, all, all, of the, all of the examples of this, but just, just a, a couple notable, uh, notable works. So Deconis and Rahm gave a probabilistic interpretation of uh, coefficients of McDonald polynomials in the um, power sum basis. There was also this very famous work by Borden and Corwin who defined McDonald point processes. And uh, so most relevant to my, to my talk is uh, this theorem by Cantini, Dehir, and Wheeler who found that uh, when all the variables except for t are set to one, then p lambda specializes to the partition function of the multi-species ASAP on a circle, which is a certain particle model. And uh, so, so why why is this important? Well, the partition function of a um, of of a, a statistical physics model. Uh, contains some some very very deep and important information about that model. For example, it conveys certain thermodynamical properties. Uh, so this so this shows that there there is uh, there is some some very intricate and and and, and deep uh, deep connection between these two areas. So let me define the, the, the ASAP now. So the classical ASAP, which was uh, introduced in, uh, in the late 60s by um, biologists and mathematicians to study some biological processes, 
uh, is a particle model on a one dimensional lattice. Uh, it can be either finite or infinite. Uh, and each, each location of the lattice may contain a particle or it may be empty. And at any time, at each time step, if we, if we discretize this process, then uh, we allow any two adjacent particles to swap with, uh, with some probability that is uh, determined by a parameter, the parameter of the model. And if there are boundaries in the lattice, then there may be interactions at the boundary. So in our case, uh, we're looking at the ASAP on a circle. So there is no boundary, so no particles can enter or leave the system. And we have a multi-species model, so we, so we denote the different types of particles by uh, non-negative integer weights. So those are, those are the labels that you see here. And so, uh, so because no particles are entering or leaving, we're just going to fix uh, fix n weights, and then we will arrange them in weakly decreasing order uh, as a partition. And so, in in this example, we have a three, three twos, a one, and three zeros. So, so this this is the ASAP of type lambda, where lambda is is this, and. And these arrows here represent possible swapping locations. And in our model, we have a parameter t, which is, uh, which is some parameter between 0 and 1. So the, the ASAP of type lambda is a Markov chain whose states are all possible rearrangements of particles on the circle. And we represent these rearrangements by compositions. Uh, so the way that you associate a composition to a, a state on the circle is we're just going to choose a designated location to cut the circle. So let's say we cut it here. And then we read the particles in clockwise order. So, so this state, we read it as 1, 2, 2, 0, 0, 0, 3, 2. So when I refer to compositions for the rest of my talk, you should be picturing them on a circle where the first uh, element is adjacent to the last one. And transitions are swaps of adjacent particles uh, or adjacent values in the composition. And these swaps occur with rate one, if the particle on the left is smaller, and with rate t, if the particle on the right is smaller. So uh, basically, the smaller particles are trying to move clockwise, and the larger ones are trying to move counterclockwise. And so a natural question for any probabilistic model is, to try to find a formula for the stationary probabilities. So what this means is that if we run this process for uh, a very long time, for infinite time, then, and we ask, what is the probability of encountering any given state? So, so those probabilities are what we call stationary probabilities. And just to see how we would compute them, well, here's an example for uh, lambda having two particles of type two, a one and two zeros. So let's look, let's look at what happens uh, to this particular state. So from this state, we have these possible transitions. So for example, if we swap the, the two and the zero here, then we, then we get this state. And this happens with probability t over five and, and so on. Uh, note that all probabilities have to sum to one. That's why um, that's why we have the the denominator five. And so we complete this picture by uh, drawing all the other states and all the all the other all the transitions between them. 
And then to compute the stationary probabilities, we just need to uh, find the, the unique left eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue one of the transition matrix. And so we get uh, these polynomials. And so this, this factor Z here is the normalizing factor. And, and what this is, is just the sum of all of these polynomials. Uh, and, and these polynomials on their own is what I call PR tilde, which is the unnormalized probability. So, so the normalizing factor is the sum over unnormalized probabilities, and that's what we call the partition function. So not only, um, yeah, yeah, so, that, so that's it. So, so our goal now is to find explicit, uh, explicit formulas for these uh, polynomials, for these probabilities. And it turns out that there is a, a quite beautiful combinatorial formula for probabilities of this process. Uh, in terms of an object from uh, queuing theory and probability called multi-line queues. So uh, I, I will denote them by MLQ for, for short. So what a multi-line queue is, is it's uh, very generally speaking, it's an arrangement of balls on a lattice where uh, we then want to pair balls from the rows above to the row below. And every possible pairing has some weight associated to it. And then if we sum over all the weights of all the possible pairings, then, uh, then we get the probability of, um, that corresponds to the state, the, the state that is read off from the bottom row of the multi-line queue. So I'm not going to go into, into detail about this object, but all you need to uh, all, all you need to get out of out of uh, this slide is that uh, we just a multi-line queue is an arrangement of balls with some way of pairing them between the rows, and then every such arrangement plus pairing gives you. A, a state of the ASAP. And then if we sum over the weights, so if we sum over all the weights of the multi-line queues, whose bottom row is the given state alpha, then we get the probability of state alpha. And so, Originally, uh, it, when t equals zero, which means that particles only swap in one direction, uh, Ferrari and Martin discovered this formula with the multi-line queues uh, in 2007. And it took a very, very, it took quite a long time. It took a lot of work uh, for, for the t to be incorporated. Uh, so it was a very recent result of, of James Martin to uh, to generalize the multi-line queue to include uh, the parameter t. So here's an example where uh, so here I drew out all possible arrangements of balls um, where we have two balls in the bottom row and one ball in the top row. And so now let's look at all possible ways of connecting the ball in the top row to somebody in the row below. So these are all, all the multi-line queues of this type. And now I, I give them labels. So when a ball uh, starts at row two, it, it acquires the label two, and then it passes that label down to whoever it's paired with. And then that's what comes out in the bottom row here. So for example, here, this ball, uh, so I'm looking at, so 
I'm looking at, at this one here. So, so the ball starts at row two, it passes it to this ball in the last column. So that gets a two. And then uh, this ball starts at row one. So it passes it down uh, to, to get the label one. And then here we have a zero because it's empty. So this multi-line Q here corresponds to the state zero, one, two. And so now to get the probabilities, the unnormalized probabilities of these states, we just have to sum over the weights of the, of the multi-line Qs, which have two, one, zero in their bottom row. So that would be uh, this first one, which has weight one and, and this one which has weight one minus T over one minus T squared. And so uh, we sum those, we get this, uh, this probability and the same for the other one. Okay, and so recall that uh, Cantini, Dehir and Wheeler had this theorem that uh, the McDonald polynomial specializes to the partition function of the ASAP. So that means that the McDonald polynomial specializes to the sum of the weights of all of these multi-line Qs. So now the question is, can we uh, incorporate the, the rest of the parameters of the McDonald polynomial, so the Xs and the Q, in order to get uh, the full McDonald polynomial? And it turns out that there is a very natural uh, natural and, and clear way to do this. So with uh, Sylvie Cortel and Lauren Williams, uh, we were able to add the parameters Q, uh, Q and X1 through Xn to the multi-line Qs in order to uh, get a formula for P lambda in, in terms of them. Uh, Can I ask a question at this point? Yes. So um, did you have a, uh, a multi-line Q interpretation for just the sure function? Was that already known? I mean, you're going already to the, to the, to the, to the McDonald, but how about the sure function? Um, yeah, so there, there's actually a, a pretty simple bijection uh, for multi-line Qs to, uh, to, to semi-standard young tableau. I see. Um, in that case. So specifically, so yeah, so to get the shear functions, we set Q equal T equals zero. And then we just get some, uh, so our multi-line Qs are going to be in bijection with semi-standard tableau. All right, because, um, and then, Inserting the the x one through x n um, is that a big step or is that is that something kind of super just relatively natural because setting all of those equal to one you lose a ton of information and now here all of a sudden you're you're throwing in these weights x one through x n and, and yeah you manage to recover a whole all that information is that. Yeah, so actually what, what is interesting is that it is super natural to uh, put in those parameters. So I, I have the example here. So the XIs are just going to record how many balls are in each column. And that's all that's happening. And then- Okay. It, it just seems weird that that wasn't in the original description. Well, that's because they they were not thinking about these objects uh, from the combinatorics perspective. I see. So they were not even thinking in terms of symmetric function. For them, it was right. a partition function. Right. Right. So so the the way that this. Um, so the, pa the paper was written by, uh, by people who, who did um, s s more physics related work. 
So they were not thinking about combinatorics when, uh, when, they, when they did this. And when my collaborators and I were, were reading their paper, we noticed that some of their pictures looked a lot like multi-line cues. And then that's how we drew the link between the multi-line cues and uh, the Cantini to here and Wheeler result. Yeah, I had spoken to Degier and and he had he was like, "Can you believe it that this that this thing shows up in such that, that the McDonald polynomial shows up in such a weird place?" And I'm like, "Well, I don't know. Like, are you kind of Jimmy? I could I couldn't tell whether he was Jimmy in it or." <laughs> but he was like really shocked that that you'd see the the multi line Q the I don't know I'm not absolutely positive that it was exactly the same. No, but. so they didn't have an actual multi line Q. What they had was a combinatorial picture that represented the combinatorial R matrix that gives that gives you the algebraic construction for um, the non symmetric McDonald polynomials. And it just looked like uh, a, a bunch of lines connecting some um, some dots on a grid. And because I had been looking at multi-line cues at that time, that's how I, I made that that connection. Yeah. So they so they were looking at different a different uh, combinatorial object, but the similarities um, le led to led to this discovery. Yeah. Okay. And then as for as for the queue, that also comes out very naturally. Uh, so we get the queue by looking at the um, the strings that wrap around. So right here in, in this one, we have a string that wraps around. And so we get a queue in the numerator and same same over here. Yes. Uh, so this formula is uh, more compact than the, the HHL formula for, for P lambda. Um, al although it is, it is quite similar, uh, I, I will um, say a little more about that on this slide. So it turns out that we, that there's a, there's a natural bijection for multi-line cues to tableau. And this bijection shows that these objects are, are actually very closely related to the, the tableau that have been used to study symmetric functions. So uh, here's the bijection. So we're just going to look at the strings of the balls and we're going to uh, record the columns that that the strings are contained in, and we're, we're recording the columns in the boxes of the filling. So for example, the string of length two is in column one. It starts in column one and then goes to column one. So we put a one one in the first column of the tableau. And then this one is in column two. So we put a two here. Um, if we look at, at this one, so our, our string of length two starts in column two and goes to column three. So we put a two, three in the first column of the filling. And then the string of, of length one uh, is in column one of the multi-line queue. So we put a one in this second column. So, uh, so now if we, if we think back to uh, how we assign the variables xi to the multi-line cues. So the variables xi are just recording how many balls are in each column. And the, uh, the entries of, of the filling are also recording which columns contain the balls. And so uh, the monomial that, um, the monomial weight of each tableau is the same as the monomial weight of each multi-line cue very naturally. Uh, and then we can also see that when, uh, so if we think about the Q statistic in the multi-line Q, so we get a Q when we wrap uh, 
our connection. But notice that this corresponds to a descent in the filling. So when we wrap, we start with a, a larger column linked to a smaller column. And that gives us a descent in the filling. So, so the Q statistic naturally translates to the major index of the filling. OK, so here's what we've done so far. So we have this. Uh, so we have our McDonald polynomials. We have this uh, specialization to the partition function of the ASUP. And then we have these multi-line queues, which are the combinatorial objects that, on one hand, uh, compute probabilities for the ASUP. And on the other hand, they uh, give us the McDonald polynomial. And they are uh, related, but uh, not the same as these um, HHL tableau, which are non-attacking fillings. And so now let me talk about the, the other side of the story. So, so we, we get to modified McDonald polynomials by applying uh, plethysm to the P lambdas. And uh, the McDonald polynomials also have a tableau formula. And so the natural question is, is there a statistical mechanics model for which the McDonald polynomials are a part of this function of? And this, we've been asking this question for, for a while now. And it turns out that there is such a model and it's called the, um, so we call it the multi-species uh, TASERP, so totally asymmetric zero range process. So what it is essentially is it's an ASAP where in each location we can have multiple particles. So in the ASAP we would have, uh, we had a one dimensional lattice where each site of the lattice can contain one particle. And here we, each site of the lattice contains any number of particles. Um, and it's called totally asymmetric because the particles can only jump in one direction. So they can only jump counterclockwise. So, uh, so here are some notations. So we're going to fix a partition lambda for the particle content, just like we did for the ASAP. And N is the number of sites on our lattice. So each, each site can contain any number of particles and particles of the same type are identical, indistinguishable. And so the states are multi-set compositions of type lambda with n parts. So, 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 here, so here's an example uh, where our partition is two, one, one. So we have one, two, and two ones, and three locations. So there's a total of 18 states. And here are some of them. And uh, so notice that these are sets. So each, each state has a set of, uh, of particles. So two, one is the same as one, two. And so in this case, we have a continuous time Markov chain where any particle may jump to the site on its left. Uh, and the rates are governed by T and x1 through xn, where uh, the, x, the xi's are site dependent. So if a particle jumps from site one, it gets uh, an x1. It, its rate depends on x1. If it jumps from uh, site two, its rate depends on x2, and so on. So I'll, I'll just explain the specifics of the rates with some examples. So uh, the rate in T is going to depend on how many particles uh, larger than, than it are in its current state. So for example, if, uh, if the two wants to jump to the left from this state, there are no particles larger than it. So it just jumps with rate 
x3 inverse. But if, if one of the ones wants to jump, then there's one particle larger than it, the two. And uh, there are two ones, so we have to multiply by one plus t. And so the rate is this one and, and so on. So, so we have these very specific rates in the x i's and t. OK, so that's, so that's what the TASERP is. Um, OK, so, so now let me talk a little bit about plethism to explain why uh, a model like the TASERP is exactly what we should expect uh, to fill the role of the particle process that we're looking for. Um, so, so plethism is, generally speaking, uh, a substitution of, of variables in a, in a certain way. So, so specifically, so, so this J lambda, that's just a normalized form of P lambda. So we can write a formula for J lambda with the same multi-line cues that we were using before. And what, what this means, what, what this bracket notation means is that we're just going to plug in this set of variables into J lambda. So before we would plug in X1, X2, X3, X4, and so on. But now we're going to plug in X1, X1 T inverse, X1 T, inverse, T to the minus two, and so on. And then the same with the X2s and, and all the other Xi's. And so recall that we can compute uh, the P lambda and as well as the J lambda using multi-line cues. Uh, so when we're computing them in N variables, then we have N columns and the columns are labeled by X1 through Xn. So now if we want to plug in these infinitely many var variables, we can just consider multi-line cues whose columns are labeled by these variables. And there's countably many of them. So we have, we have infinitely many columns, but because uh, we don't want to deal with uh, an infinite object, we want to deal with a finite object. It turns out that we can imagine uh, this infinite multi-line queue sort of wrapping around itself and then we can allow, uh, what, what happens is we just allow there to be multiple balls in each location of the multi-line queue. So with, with, with some appropriate weights in T. So we call this a poly queue uh, because it's a multi-line queue where each location can have many balls. And uh, because these multi-line cues are, are a bit hard to, to draw and, and hard to see what's going on in them, we are going to just immediately use the Tableau representation to, to think about them. So, so this is using the same bijection between multi-line cues and Tableau that I showed you before. So we're just going to record the locations of the balls in each string. So for example, if we look at this red string, it has length four. So it goes into the column of, of size four and it starts at row, I'm sorry, it starts at, at column one, goes to column two, then goes back to one and then one again. So we record a, one, two, one, one. So in, in the first column of the filling. Uh, so now this black, this black string, let's look at that next. So it starts in column two, goes to three, goes to four, and then wraps around and goes to three. So we record two, three, four, three in this column. And, and so on. So, so from now on, I'm just going to be talking about poly Q tableau, which I call PQT, 
But when you see a tableau, you should be uh, in the back of your mind, you should be thinking about uh, this type of picture, so polyq. Uh, okay, can and a, can, I, can I ask a question right now? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, do you put an order on the um, on the multi queue models? Do you put an order on the queues um, since you have three different columns of like a length four here? Yes. Yes. So, so this is a, a bit of a, a bit of a technical question. So, yes, we do put an order, but we multiply by the t analog of the number of ways of permuting those columns. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. So basically, I can I can just fix an order. Uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can give some deterministic way to order them, but then I'm going to multiply by, uh, by one plus t times one plus t plus t squared, yeah. okay. because Thanks. there are six, there's three factorial ways of permuting them. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. Can I ask something here? Um, so let's say you want to attack the McDonald positivity conjecture. Can you see the uh, ASAP model as a submodel within this one? So that, you know, you, I mean, I guess the submodel would be when you set Q and T to be zero, that's the sure function. And then you want to express these objects as I, I guess you uh, yeah you want to express these objects as 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 some sort of linear combinations of the of the sure functions right so is there a possibility that you kind of see one substructure within the other like especially even at this at the at the sub at the the q equals uh, one over t, and then, like, there's one there's one specialization where you actually see the sure function inside of the of the of the McDonald polynomial, and can you see that that particular piece as a sure function as an ASAP? I'll I'll have to think about that. What you just said about the the specific case where you said. Yeah, I'll have I'll have to think about that and look at some examples, but I have tried some tried to to extract the sure functions from this somehow or expansions, and I did not see anything promising uh, when I did it the naive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's one coefficient that's in in the H lambda tildes that say it's going to be one. And that you can specialize like q equals t equals zero, and you and you and that's that's a a real sub 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 multi multi tasap taser. <laughs> but the question is, is that also at, uh, an asap at q equals t equals zero? I think so. Yes. Okay. I there, think there, it... there's step one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I will think about that a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so I will describe, so the, so I will describe the, the poly Q tableau, what they are. So, so the poly Q tableau are unrestricted fillings of the diagram of shape lambda with integers one through n. So this is, uh, so if you're familiar with the Hagelin, Hamm, and Lur formula, uh, so that formula also has the same, uh, the same fillings. So a diagram of shape lambda, so the columns are uh, of length lambda i. Okay, so the leg of the cell is, of a cell is all the cells above it in the same column. The descents are uh, all cells with content greater than the cell below. And the sum over the legs of the descents is the major index. So this, this is the same as uh, the HHL formula. What's different from the HHL formula is that 
where we have a different definition of triples. So if you're familiar with HHL, so their, so their triples look like this. So you have two adjacent cells in the same column and uh, a cell to the right in the same row as the one above. But for us, our cell to the right is in the same row as the one below. So that's the only difference between our object and the HHL tableau. And this has to do with changing the reading order. So in the HHL tableau, uh, our reading order is top to bottom, left to right. And in our fillings, the reading order is top to bottom, right to left. So this different reading order, it, it then forces us to have this definition of the triple. Uh, we also have a degenerate triple. So if you imagine the top cell of the triple uh, is not existing, then, then we end up with a degenerate triple. Okay, and so the, so, uh, the quin Q inversion or quinv triple is uh, the analog of inversions of HHL tableau. So a triple is a Q inversion if uh, the entries are increasing when read in, so that, yeah, the entries when read in increasing order are counterclockwise after we standardize based on um, our reading order. And here are examples of triples uh, of quin and, and examples of not quin triples. And the, the formula is uh, T to the quin Q to the mag. So that's the weight of a filling times the content uh, times X to the content. So here's an example. So here I highlighted some uh, quinv triples. So these are the degenerate ones. And there's a total of 12 of them. Uh, the, the major index is, is five and this is our content. So that's the weight of this filling. And so our theorem is that uh, if we sum over uh, these, these tableau, then we get the modified McDonald polynomial. So here's an example. Uh, so, so remember when, so when you asked about the order of the columns, so this is where uh, that comes into play because all of these fillings, I, I'm just taking a fixed order of columns and then I'm multiplying by uh, the T analog of the number of ways of permuting the columns. Okay, and so and here's how we now connect the taser to the PolyQ tableau. So again, we're just going to look at what happens in the bottom row of the tableau and the bottom row will tell us what state of the taser uh, the tableau corresponds to. And specifically uh, the value of, uh, the value here is going to tell us which, uh, which locate which column or which site this this particle type belongs to so so this first column it corresponds to a particle of type 3 because the column is of length 3 and because there's a one here that means it's in site 1 of the taser so that first column corresponds to this 3 here the second column is also of whoops is also of type 3 and four here means that it's in site four of a taser. So that is represented by this three here. This, uh, this column of length two is in site two. So there's a two. This column of length two is in site one. So there's a one and so on. So that's how you read the state of a taser from a filling. And uh, this theorem just says that the unnormalized probability of a state is the sum over all uh, all of these uh, poly Q tableau with the corresponding bottom row. So here's, here's our summary. So we have this picture of McDonald polynomials connected to 
the ASAP with multi-line cues, uh, interpolating between the probabilities and the polynomial. And uh, what, what, we, what we did uh, with uh, Arvind and James is we found the analogous particle model whose partition function uh, is a specialization of H tilde. And the, the polycue tableau, which is the combinatorial object that gives us on one hand probabilities, on the other hand computes the McDonald polynomial. And, and, this, and these objects are related to the, the well-known HHL tableau. So, uh, so first of all, what, what's interesting is that we don't know how how to go from HHL tableau to our fillings. So I would I would really like to see an explicit bijection. Actually, uh, just just today, uh, I somebody uh, told me that they know how to find a bijection when uh, when Q equals zero. So so that's nice. Um, the the second point I wanted to make is so for for p lambda with multi line cues, we were able to define quasi symmetric McDonald polynomials with uh, Cortell, Haglin, Mason, and Williams. And so these quasi symmetric McDonald polynomials uh, are are generalizations of the quasi symmetric shear function. So so they have some some nice properties. And it is actually possible to do a parallel construction with PolyQ Tableau to get a family of quasi-symmetric polynomials that refine H tilde. And it would be uh, very, very interesting to see if these quasi-symmetric functions ha have some, some good properties. Uh, it, so far, it looks like they are positive in the, in the fundamental quasi-symmetric functions and maybe some, some other nice properties. And uh, these are my references. So part, part two is, uh, is in preparation, which is the probability part. Uh, the combinatorics part, which is the, the proof that our formula gives McDonald polynomials is in this, this archive paper. So thank you all for, uh, for attending my talk. Thank you. Uh, great talk. And uh, maybe uh, we have a few more questions. You have, you had nice question during the talk. Yes, Mike. Oh, I thought you were uh, raising. Your oh yeah, hand. no, I'm here. Yeah, I was raising my hand. Um, <laughs> the 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 quasi symmetric. Um, McDonald polynomials that you, you mentioned, are they, do they specialize to quasi shores or is there like, so is, yes. there, there, is there a shore basis that goes with it? So it's quasi shores, those are? Yes. Okay. And are those related to the uh, QT analogs of quasi shores that they had previously been defined? Um, in, um, in one special case, in in the Hall Littlewood case, yes. In the Hall Littlewood case, okay. If you specialize one of the variable to zero or one, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. So, so if you, uh, yeah, if you set t equal to zero, then you get the Hall Littlewood case. Or I think, sorry, I think it's actually q equal to zero. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, but otherwise, it's different. Keep all these statistics in mind. <laughs> so otherwise, it's different. It's it's a it's a different QT analog of the quasi shores. Yes, it is different. So, um, yeah, I'm. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to remember what made our quasi symmetric McDonald's uh, a, a good candidate. Uh, 
to to be called quasimetric McDonald polynomial since there since there have been some other some other definitions. Uh, Yeah, I I, th I think I think that uh, I, I think the fact that they refine p lambda is is one of is one of the properties. Oh, you mm -hmm. have it for the p lambda, or you have it for the h lambda? Oh, so for so for the p lambda, we defined the quasi-symmetric McDonald. For the for the h lambda, it's possible to do the same. The same, but I don't know if it's if that's worth it. I see. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, I have a question. <clears throat> yeah, so. Each variable shows a column, and then you have infinite actually in the variables. So this means we have infinite object. And then I think you said to to change it from infinite to finite, then you classify it in the classes. Mm -hmm. yes. Am I right? Yes, that's right. And each class has a weight and T associated to it. Okay. Thank you. Any further question? Yeah, I have a question. So it's yes. kind of related to your, your first uh, question there. So you said your formula in the McDonald case is more compact than Heckman's formula. So, I mean, because, so is there a, is, is there known some kind of uh, so that means like the their tableau can be indexed by these uh, multi-line Q objects, uh, partitioned with index with these multi-line Q. Is that is that correct? Because that yeah. Uh, yes, it is correct. Um, so so basically every multi-line Q tableau, it is also an HHL tableau. Oh, okay. But there are there are several there are, there are several HHL tableau that will uh, sum to the weight of a single multi-line Q. Ah, okay. So then, is there is, is do you know like explicitly how to describe? No, um, no. So so I don't know how to describe that compression. Ah, okay. It's an interesting question, I guess. Yeah, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if, yeah, that's why we haven't looked into it more because we just don't know if, if that's worth um, spending too much time on. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. I have a question too. Go ahead. Um, for your Q invariant, um, that was defined on the poly Q tableau, right? Um, but if I recall, your poly Q tableau, you chose a specific way of ordering your columns, right? Um, does that, and then afterward, because then you just multiplied by the one plus t's, et cetera, in order to do all the things. Mm -hmm. um, does that change your Q invariance? Like if you, like, so obviously if you change your columns, you're gonna have a different Q invariance. So like, how do the two interplay with one another so that everything kind of fits nicely. Like if you choose a different order, does your Q invariant stay invariant or if that makes Wait, sense? What, what do you mean by the Q invariant? Uh, Quim? Oh. Sorry. Oh, yeah. so so that's actually, it's, it's, that's very interesting that uh, it turns out that if you, if you sum over, so if you take all the possible orderings of columns, then it's going to, and, and some are the weights, that's going to equal the weight of, uh, of sort of the, the, the minimal, the, the minimal, the, the, um, the filling with the fewest number of inversions times this, uh, times the T analog of the, of all the permutations. And you can you can do that for HHL as well. So you you partition all the HHL tableau into classes uh, where 
the columns are arranged such that you have the minimal number of inversions. And then you just multiply that by all the ways of permuting the columns, the, the T analog of that. Okay. And that's, that's a non-trivial non uh, fact. Yeah. yeah. That works. Thank you. Okay. So if we don't have any more questions, let's thank the speaker once again. Uh,